Now it's recording. Okay. It's recording? It says it is. Okay. Hi, honey. Cool. <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A wise man once said, the way to achieve inner peace is to finish all things you have started. So he looked about the house to see what things he had started which needed to be finished. And before leaving the house that morning, he finished off a bottle of red wine, a bottle of white wine, a bottle of Prozac, some Valium, some cheesecake, and a box of chocolates. You have no idea how good he felt. That's one road to peace, but I doubt it's going to last very long. One of the primary messages of Easter this year, in a very troubled time, is that God brings peace into the world. And if ever there was an occasion for us to need that peace, we certainly have it in our world today. Whether it's people bringing an automatic weapon into a San Diego synagogue and shooting up the place, or people going into an Islamic mosque with an automatic weapon and shooting up the place, or people driving their cars into a crowd of people, or hurricanes, tsunamis, fires. We've had it all this year. The only thing we missed were the locusts, and those are probably coming later. But where do we find peace of mind in all of this? We find it in Jesus. He comes to the people who have been his followers. Now, let's set the scene for this. Here are his disciples. They saw him die. They watched his body being buried. And then that morning, they hear from the women, we went to the tomb and it was empty. And there were angels there who told us that he has risen from the dead just as he said he would. We know of at least two of the apostles, John and Peter, who went to the tomb and saw it as the women had said. So he's alive. He's risen. So why lock the door? They're in the upper room, and the door is locked. John tells us, for fear of the Jews. Their very realistic concern was that they weren't done yet. They'd cut the head off the snake, but now they were coming back for the rest of the body. And perhaps these priests would not be satisfied until all of Jesus' followers had been wiped out. And so I don't blame them for locking the door. I don't blame them for cowering behind the locked door, expecting that any minute those temple police officers would come bursting in and arrest them. Well, you can lock the priests out, but you can't stop Jesus. He didn't need to have the door unlocked. He simply appeared in their presence. And what was the first thing he said to them? Peace be with you. Anybody remember the second thing he said to them? Peace be with you. Jesus felt that was so important a message that he needed to say it twice. Peace, serenity, tranquility. Now we'll talk more about the nature of that in just a minute. But I would be willing to wager that there might be people in this room this morning who have never been afraid, 
who have never had a moment of concern. If that's you, raise your hand, please. Nobody? None of you have ever gone through your life without fear? Well, good. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> nice to know that I'm as human as you are. In fact, a poll recently conducted revealed that 54% of all those surveyed fear dying in a car crash. 53% of those surveyed fear dying of cancer. 49%, this must have been a group of our age, certainly not teenagers, 49% had a fear that they would not have enough money for their retirement. <clears throat> Is the world a safer place now than it was when you were a kid? If you're a follower of social media, you see things like that posted all the time about how we grew up and played in the dirt and never gave it a second thought. We drank water out of a hose. The idea of bottled water was inconceivable. We stayed out till dark and came in only when the street lights came on or we heard our mother yelling for us. Just picture all the little Kellys running in as Nancy stepped outside the door and yelled for them. It does seem like it was a simpler time, doesn't it? Maybe it was. Or maybe we just weren't as aware as we are today of all the ugliness and evil in the world. So what do we do with that? The word irene, the Greek word that gives us peace, is a word that means order, harmony, and spiritual well-being. Now here's the beauty of this. This is not a statement that says if we trust and believe in the resurrected Jesus, all our problems will go away. If you were broke before you became a Christian, you're still broke now. If you were fighting with somebody in your family before you became a Christian, chances are you're probably still fighting with that person. If you had an illness before you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and entered into a relationship with God, your cold is not going to magically go away. Neither will the cancer, or the heart disease, or the high blood pressure, or whatever it is you've got that my doctor yells at me about. We're still the same people we were yesterday. Now I'm not saying that Jesus can't make a difference in any of those circumstances. Of course he can. And miracles happen all around us every single day. When you look at the disciples and what they were experiencing, it was a very real threat for their lives. And Jesus appears among them to say, it's okay. I'm here. Think back to the 14th chapter of John, where Jesus said to the disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it the way the world does. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace that God gives us, the meaning of the resurrection, is that in the midst of the catastrophe, we rest assured in God's hands. Does that mean that the gunman's bullet won't strike us? Or the disease will not touch us? Does that mean that the meathead person in your family with whom you had the argument yesterday is suddenly going to come to his or her senses and realize that you were right? No. None of that. What it does say, however, is that God makes a difference in you and brings you a sense of peace and tranquility, knowing that God is there for you in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the darkness. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. God uses these circumstances 
touch our hearts and our lives. Now the wondrous part of this, as it was for Thomas, is that once we realize that God's peace is a part of our lives, we can be transformed and we can make a difference. Remember what we read in the New Testament lesson this morning. Those frightened, cowardly men who hid behind doors are now standing in the most public place in Jerusalem proclaiming the name of Jesus and doing so with passion and with boldness. And even when they're thrown into jail for it, even when they're hauled in front of the high priest and told, knock it off, Peter says, no. We must rather, rather obey God than human beings. Christ offers us that same peace as well. He doesn't rebuke our anxieties. He simply says, be at peace. It's like the verse from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I've got a couple of students in my classes who, because of the nature of their disability, very easily become anxious and can start to scream and yell. And one of the things that has been an effective response on my part is to get them to make eye contact with me and tell them, be still. Be still. Be still. Be still. I don't give them the last part because this is a classroom, not a church. But be still and know that you are not alone. Be still and know that we are here for you. And, and I hear God speaking to us. In those times when we're tempted to fret, when we're tempted to be anxious, when we're tempted to worry, be still and know that I am God. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We worship God with our offering.